Good evening, folks. Good to see you this evening as we meet together for our time of worship. A very warm welcome to you on this lovely day. Uh, a few things to mention before we get underway uh, tonight. Uh, the first is that we're in Mark's Gospel again. We continue tonight with our series in Mark, looking at the last little bit of chapter 1. And the other thing to say for tonight is that the voting papers are due in this evening, so if you've not yet uh, submitted yours, then please do so at the end of the service. Um, you've heard already about the wedding this week. We're looking forward uh, to that. Uh, Tuesday at 12 o'clock, Sam and Elspeth's wedding here. And then on Wednesday evening at 7.30, the uh, prayer gathering. Alan's speaking uh, at this week, and we look forward to that as well. Next weekend, we have our services at half past 11 and 6 o'clock, as usual. Continuing with our current series in Judges and Mark, I should have said this morning, the, the morning service next week will be a communion service. Uh, the service is at the usual times next Sunday. Uh, thank you to all those who were out yesterday morning here at the work day, getting things tidied up here. Do appreciate uh, that help. And a reminder about the outing, which is on the 19th of June, a trip up to Port Stewart and uh, all being well, a barbecue there and, and time together as a church family on the beach. So do have that date in your diary. That's all of the announcements for uh, this week. Let me read uh, some verses uh, from First Chronicles chapter 29 as our call to worship this evening. Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honour come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. So let's praise our God together as we turn to Psalm 24. And we're going to sing the first eight verses of this psalm. Psalm 24 and verses 1 to 8. The world and all in it are gods, all peoples of the earth. For it was founded by the Lord upon the seas beneath. Psalm 24, verses 1 to 8, and we'll stand and sing together.
Please be seated. While we come to God in prayer now, so let's all pray together. Our Heavenly Father, as we come before you in prayer, we give our praise first of all because you are the God who has made all things. And we've just sung to you those words of Psalm 24, which acknowledge the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. And we praise you that as we look around at the beauty of creation, on a day like today especially, that you are the God who has made it all, and it speaks of your glory. And you uphold the creation each moment, sustaining all things. As we read later on in your word, in you we live and move and have our being. And we praise you furthermore for giving to us your son Jesus, who is the promised king who rules over all things forevermore. And again we thank you for what this great psalm says of him, that he is the one who has clean hands and a pure heart. He is the king of glory, the Lord, strong and mighty in battle. And we thank you that King Jesus has now ascended the hill of the Lord. He has died and risen again and ascended to heaven. And he is seated on the throne of heaven at your right hand. And we confess that we are those whose hands are unclean and whose hearts are impure. And so have mercy on us, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out our transgressions, wash away all our iniquity, cleanse us from our sin. Against you and you only have we sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Wash us that we may be whiter than snow, for a contrite and broken heart, O God, you will not despise. Restore us to fellowship with you, that we may walk in the full assurance of your promises and in the freedom of knowing that you care for us and have brought us to yourself by the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, draw near to us tonight, we pray, as we gather to worship you. We pray for the help of the Holy Spirit, that he would be at work in each of our hearts, that he would show us Jesus, that he would open our minds to understand your word more fully and more deeply, and that we would grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. Father, in his name we pray all of these things. Amen. I'm going to read some verses now from Titus chapter 3 as our words of encouragement this evening, having just acknowledged our sinfulness before God in our prayer this evening. Let's now be encouraged by the assurance of cleansing that is offered to us in Christ. Paul writes in Titus chapter 3, We ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, Slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Saviour, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Great words of encouragement there from Titus chapter 3. Well, we're we going to sing once again. If you could turn with me in your hymn book, please to hymn number 202. Again, we're going to sing of what Christ has done for us 
to cleanse us and forgive us and bring us back to God. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a saviour. Hymn number 202. Again, we'll stand and sing together. seated. And we're going to read God's word now as we come to Mark's gospel once again. We're starting this evening, uh, we'll start reading from verse 35 this evening. Mark chapter 1 and starting our reading from verse 35. We read there, and rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he, that is Jesus, departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is what I came for. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone. But go, 
show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town but was out in desolate places and people were coming to him from every quarter. There we end our reading of God's word tonight and thank him for his inspired word. Well, with those verses in mind, we'll turn to our God in prayer now with our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. So let's all pray together. Our great God and Heavenly Father, as we bow before you in prayer once again, and as we have these particular words of Mark chapter 1 fresh in our minds now, we give you our thanks for our Lord Jesus and all that he has done for us. We thank you that as we see in this story, Jesus is the one who is both able and willing to cleanse and to forgive and to heal. He is the one who is able to take those who are cut off from you and your people and make them clean and welcome them back in. And we thank you that he has done that for us. If we're his, he's cleansed us and brought us back to you. And we give you our thanks for all the grace that is ours in Christ. And even as we thank you for what you've done in our lives through Jesus, we're conscious of others as well, those who are as yet without Christ and without hope in this world. And we pray that you would do for many others what you have done for us in Christ. We pray for many in this community here in Crumlin, those known to us in our family groups and in our friendship circles, those known to us in workplaces or those who are our neighbours who are yet outside of Christ. Father, we pray that you would bring them to him. And as well as that people across our community, perhaps not known to us, we pray that there would be a great work of God in this place, that you would build up your people here. Father, we pray also for the work of the gospel elsewhere. We thank you for those friends and partners we have in mission work in other parts of the world. We pray, Father, that you would strengthen them and be with them and that you would use them for your glory and for the extension of your kingdom. We do continue to bring before you our brother Peter over in Portugal in the last few weeks of his time there. We pray that as his time of study comes to an end, that you would continue to bless him and use him for your glory. We pray also for the Watson family over in Sweden, and we've heard in recent days of ill health and many struggles there, and we pray that you would bring Trevor and members of his family back to full strength in the coming days, and that you would continue to use them for your work over in Sweden. So, Father, we pray for the work of the gospel here and elsewhere, and we thank you also that in these verses we see that Jesus is the one who is able to deal with sickness and to grant healing. And Father, our hearts go out at this time to those within our fellowship here facing great difficulty due to ill health. We think of those as well struggling with old age or infirmity. Father, we're mindful in particular for the, the struggles that Stephen is facing at this time as he and the family find out more in the coming days. Father, we cry out to you on Stephen's behalf. We pray that his health would be restored fully. And we pray that your grace would be poured out richly on the whole family at this time. We pray on for Ken as well, and for Maud and family, and for others as well who are going through very difficult times in life. Father, we pray, would you be their portion and their strength each day? Father, we pray that as a church, you would add to us and build us up. Guide us forward, we pray, and add to us those who are being saved. And as well as that, Father, we pray not only for numerical growth in the, the church here, but as well as that, for spiritual growth, 
that we ourselves might grow in Christ-likeness each day. Father, we thank you that you've placed us in the world. And as we look around at the, the world in which we live, we know that there is so much that concerns us and saddens us as society turns away from you. And Father, we pray that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray in particular for those who are leaders in society. You call us to pray for them. Father, we pray that you would give them hearts of wisdom, help them to govern in line with your word. And we pray for, for this evening as we gather in this way to hear your word. Lord, we thank you for the freedom we have to do this. We know that many Christians around the world lack this kind of freedom and we rejoice in it. We rejoice that we can meet freely as your people and hear the gospel proclaimed. And we pray that tonight your spirit would be at work in and through the preaching of your word and in the hearts of all who hear that he might shape us to be more like the people we are called to be for your glory's sake. And in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Well, let's turn now to hymn number 496 in 496. Great hymn. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power. Hymn 496, we'll stand and we'll sing together. let's pray together father we thank you for the words we've just sung and we thank you that there is cleansing in christ from sin's guilt and sin's power 
And as we look at Jesus now, as he is shown to us in your word, Father, be with me, we pray. Be with us all. Show us more of Jesus through the work of your spirit as he illuminates your word and shape us to be those who trust and follow Christ because we ask it in his name and for your glory's sake. Amen. Please do keep your Bible open at those final few verses from Mark chapter 1. Over the course of the past year and a bit, we have become very familiar, haven't we, with the whole idea of social distancing. We've faced all of those regulations and restrictions about staying at home, not going into other people's houses, only seeing a, a certain number of people, and of course making sure that we stay two meters apart from other people at all times. We've been living in this socially distanced world and it has given to us just a very tiny taste of what life was like for those who suffered with leprosy in Bible times. Now the word leprosy uh, in the New Testament and Old Testament it refers not simply to what we think of today as leprosy rather in the Bible that word is used to describe literally dozens and dozens of different skin diseases and yet those who suffered with such diseases were forced to live a socially distanced life they lived constantly under these very strict restrictions and regulations they had to leave their family they had to leave their home and their town they had to go and live apart from everyone else out of town out in desolate places and of course they weren't allowed to gather with God's people they weren't allowed to go to the temple or the synagogue they were cut off from the assembly of God's people they were considered unclean and the rules were not just two meters but rather 50 paces they had to stay 50 paces away from anybody else and of course the background to this is found in the old testament ceremonial law listen to these words from leviticus 13 which describe just some of the social distancing regulations that lepers had to live under during the days of the old covenant it says there in Leviticus 13, the leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose and he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. And you see, don't you, in those days, leprosy left a person, firstly, unclean in regard to God's law, cut off from God's people. And if the condition went unhealed, it would, in the end, lead to death. And that's why leprosy in the Bible is often a picture for sin. Because like leprosy, sin makes us unclean with regard to God's law. Sin cuts us off from being a part of God's people. And if that condition of sin is not dealt with, it leads to death in the end. Here's how J.C. Ryle describes the way in which leprosy in the Bible is likened to sin. He says, is there nothing like leprosy among ourselves yes indeed there is there is a, fo a foul soul disease which is ingrained into our very nature and cleaves to our bones and marrow with deadly force that disease is the plague of sin like leprosy it is a deep-seated disease 
infecting every part of our nature, heart, will, conscience, understanding, memory, and affections. Like leprosy, it makes us loathsome and abominable, unfit for the company of God, and unmeet for the glory of heaven. Like leprosy, it is an incurable disease, incurable by any earthly physician, and is slowly but surely dragging us down to the second death. And worst of all, far worse than leprosy, it is a disease from which no mortal man is exempt. We are all in God's sight as an unclean thing. Well, this horrible condition of leprosy is really the backdrop to the short story that we come to this evening in Mark chapter 1, where we see Jesus interacting with a man suffering from leprosy. And I want us to notice this, first of all. Jesus has compassion for unclean people. Jesus has compassion for unclean people. Now, we're not told exactly when or where this story happened. We know that it's somewhere up in the region of Galilee, early on in the public ministry of Jesus. But we are told this, a leper came to him. A leper came to him. Now, it's easy, isn't it, to just skim past those verses uh, or those words and miss the significance of what is being said there. Remember, this man was living under all of those regulations about social distancing. He wasn't allowed even within 50 paces of anyone else. And yet all of that just goes out of the window here, doesn't it? When he sees Jesus. He's obviously heard something about Jesus. He knows about Jesus' miracles and teaching. How Jesus has been able to heal people. How Jesus has been able to drive out demons. And so when he sees Jesus, he comes right up to him straight away. And he does more than that. He implores him. He kneels before him. He says to him, if you will, you can make me clean. Well, how is Jesus going to respond to this bold approach? Is Jesus going to recoil from this man? Tell him to keep his distance because he's unclean. Tell him to get 50 paces away and then maybe they can talk. Well, no, quite the opposite. Mark says, Jesus was moved with pity. The word that Mark uses there for pity is a very strong word. It means deep compassion. And there may even be a sense of anger and indignation wrapped up in that word. Not anger against the man himself, but anger about the suffering that this man is going through. Jesus is the eternal son of God. This is his world. He made it and he made it well. But now, of course, it is a fallen world. Now it's a world of sin and suffering. And Jesus is rightly indignant at that. And he is moved with great compassion for this man who is living through the misery of a fallen world and the compassion of Jesus becomes even more clear in what happens next he stretched out his hand and touched him and again those words sh should shock us in those days you would never touch someone who had leprosy you would steer as clear from them as possible. But not Jesus. He welcomes this man to himself. And with compassion, he even reaches out and he touches him. This is probably the first time in weeks, maybe even months, that this man has felt the touch of another human being. And you see what Mark is showing to us in these verses about Jesus. He's showing us that Jesus has compassion for unclean people. He does not drive them away. He does not steer clear of them. He doesn't keep them at arm's length. He doesn't recoil from them. He's not disgusted by them. 
Now, when they come to him, he welcomes them to himself. He shows compassion to them. I wonder, do you feel unclean this evening somehow? Unclean before God because of all the the sin in your life and you think, well, why would Jesus want anything to do with someone like me? I've messed up big time. I've fallen short. My life's a mess. And if I tried to approach Jesus with all this sin that I have, he would recoil from me. He would push me away. And if that is what you feel, then I hope you see from this story that that is not what Jesus is really like. He has compassion for unclean people. And no one who comes to him will he turn away. He has compassion for those who are unclean. And that leads to the the second thing to notice this evening. And that is this. That Jesus can make unclean people clean. Jesus can make unclean people clean. So the man has come to Jesus and said to him, if you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, Jesus has stretched out his hand and he has touched this other man. Then look what happens next. Jesus says to him, I will be clean. In other words, not only is Jesus able to make the man clean again, he's willing to do so. He's willing to do so. Verse 42 shows us the outcome of that ability and willingness of Jesus to make the man clean. We read there, and immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. Amazingly, wonderfully, this man is healed instantaneously through Christ's powerful and effective word, be clean. And it's almost as if the cleanness of Jesus is transferred to this man when Jesus takes hold of him and speaks his word to him and in that very moment everything that this man was suffering with in relation to his leprosy is overturned instantly previously he was unclean in relation to God's law but now he can be declared clean in relation to God's law previously he was cut off from God's people, now he can be welcomed in. He can go back to his family once again. He can see his friends again. He can take part in public worship again, be a part of the assembly of God's people as they gather to worship him. And whereas previously he was facing the prospect of death, he is now given new life. You see what Mark is showing us here, don't you? Jesus can make unclean people clean. And how does he do that? He does so as he takes hold of them and speaks to them through his word as the means of grace for that. And it's a a picture of the gospel, isn't it, what we're seeing here? This is what Jesus does for unclean people like us. He makes us clean and whilst by nature and by practice we're people who are unclean in relation to God's law Jesus the only person who has lived a truly pure life in relation to God's law gives to us as a free gift his cleanness his purity his righteousness and as it were when Jesus takes hold of us and speaks his word to us powerfully and effectively effectually calling us to new life as we come to new life that cleanness of Jesus is transferred to us and becomes ours and so before God we declare right and if you're a Christian you can say this I am as clean and as pure in God's sight as Jesus himself is but not because of anything I've done because I'm a sinner I've lived an unclean life in relation to God's law. But Jesus, in his grace and compassion towards me, has taken hold of me and he has spoken his word to me. And he has washed me clean by dying on the cross for me and he has given to me as a gift his righteousness. Transferred to me, transferred to my account, 
counted to me just as if I had lived the perfect, clean life that Jesus lived. And whilst we were at one time cut off from God's people in our uncleanness, now through Jesus and in him we're included, gathered into the family of God. We take our place amongst the assembly of God's people because Jesus has made us fit for that. And whilst our sin was leading us towards eternal death, now we've been rescued from that. Eternal life is ours through Jesus. Jesus has compassion for unclean people and Jesus can make unclean people clean. Then thirdly, notice this. Jesus suffered exclusion for the sake of unclean people. Jesus suffered exclusion for the sake of unclean people. Now, in verses 43 to 45, there's a a strange but interesting contrast that takes place, which is easy to miss, but I want you to notice it. Look at verse 44 to start with. Jesus says to the man, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. Now there's a few things to unpack there, but the first is this. Why does Jesus tell the man that he needs to go and see a priest and make an offering and prove to them that he is clean? Why bother with that? After all, Jesus knows that the man is clean. He is fully healed, no doubt about it. And why go and see another priest? Because Jesus is the great high priest who has already declared that this man is clean. And so in a sense, this is a little bit superfluous, you might say. And yet Jesus here is acting in obedience to the law of God, what Moses had commanded. The Old Testament Mosaic law is still in force in those days. And Jesus here is willingly submitting himself to that law. He will fulfill the law perfectly. He will fulfill all righteousness. And you see, here we have a a picture of Jesus as the obedient one, the one who obeys the law of God perfectly. And then in contrast to that, the man who was healed is the disobedient one. He's the disobedient one. Jesus says to him, see that you say nothing to anyone. And the man just disobeys that, doesn't he? Verse 45, he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news. Now, you might be thinking at this point, why on earth does Jesus tell the man not to say anything to anyone about what Jesus has done for him? That sounds strange to our ears to hear that, doesn't it? Aren't we meant to tell people about Jesus? Aren't we meant to tell as many as we can about Jesus and what he has done for us? So why does Jesus command him not to do that, to say nothing to anyone about Jesus? You maybe heard of it before, but it's something that is normally described as the messianic secret. Especially early on in Jesus' public ministry, there are many, many times in the Gospels when he commands people not to say to other people anything about him. So why the messianic secret? There's probably a couple of reasons for that. Part of it, I think, is an issue of timing. If everyone that Jesus healed, and he healed a lot of people, but if everyone who Jesus had healed went around telling every Tom, Dick and Harry that the Messiah has come, well, the ministry of Jesus would become too public too soon and would attract opposition from the religious leaders and the Roman authorities very, very quickly. And there's a sense in which Jesus is pacing his ministry here. He doesn't want all of that opposition arriving straight away. He knows that his time to die has not yet come. And so through the messianic secret, he is, as it were, pacing his ministry in line with God's timing. Only at the appointed hour would Jesus face death. So there's an issue of timing here. But as well as that, and I think more importantly, there's an issue of understanding here as well. Yes, he is the Messiah, but he is not the kind of Messiah that many of the people in those days were expecting. He is, as we saw this morning, an unexpected kind of 
Messiah, not what people would normally expect. They were hoping for a political, military Messiah who would defeat the Romans. And it's not what Jesus came to do. He came to die and rise again. He came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He came to suffer first and then be glorified. And so before the news of Messiah's arrival is announced far and wide to everyone, Jesus wants to define his ministry first because you can only understand the kind of Messiah Jesus is by understanding the cross. And so for these reasons, during the early part of his ministry, Jesus often tells people not to say anything to anyone else about him. He's pacing his ministry and he's defining his ministry. Now, of course, we are to tell others about Jesus. The so-called messianic secret no longer applies. And yet for a particular season, early on in the earthly ministry of Jesus, it was better for people to keep quiet about him. But that's not what the man did, is it? He went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news. Now notice what Mark is showing us here very subtly. There is a contrast in these verses between the obedient one and the disobedient one. Jesus, the obedient one, the one who obeys the law of God perfectly, and the healed man who is the disobedient one who blatantly ignores Christ's command. Now, what is the consequence of the man's disobedience? The consequence is verse 45. Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places. And people were coming to him from every quarter. Now, don't miss the irony here. Stand back from the story for a moment and consider this. At the start of the story, the leper was not able to enter a town openly and had to stay out in desolate places. By the end of the story, that is what Jesus himself experiences. And there's a sense in which Jesus suffers the lot of the unclean man and does so as a result of that man's disobedience. Do you see the irony and, and the reversal in what happens in the story? In a very literal way, Jesus swaps places with this man. He does so in two ways. Firstly, he gives his cleanness to this unclean man. But in return, Jesus takes upon himself the plight of the unclean man. The disobedient one is declared clean and is welcomed in. And the obedient one becomes like an unclean man and is driven out. And again, it's a, a picture of the gospel, isn't it? Jesus suffered exclusion for the sake of unclean people. He did so at the cross. The obedient one became like an unclean man and was driven out, put to death outside the city, cut off for sin, so that disobedient ones like us can be declared clean and welcomed in. And you see, don't you, this story is a great dramatic retelling of the gospel story. That Jesus has compassion for unclean people. Jesus can make them clean. And Jesus suffered exclusion for the sake of unclean people. And that leaves just one more thing to say as we look at this story tonight. And that is that all of this is received by faith in Jesus. All of this is received by faith in Jesus. Look at how the story begins. Let's go back to the start. Verse 40. And a leper came to Jesus, imploring him, and kneeling said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. And everything that this man does in verse 40 is a picture of faith in Jesus. He comes to Jesus. No matter about keeping a safe social distance because he's unclean. No, this man comes right to Jesus, directly to him. He implores him. That is, he cries out to Jesus for help. He's desperate. He's needy. 
He has no hope in himself. And so he looks away to Christ in self-abandoning trust in Jesus. He kneels before Jesus. That is, he, he humbles himself before Jesus out of reverence for him. And he says, if you will, you can make me clean. He believes in the power of Jesus to save him. And he puts all of his trust in him. And you see, everything that he received that day was received through faith in Jesus. And as well as the social undistancing that took place that day, there was also a kind of spiritual undistancing as this man came to Jesus in faith. And here's the challenge for us as we read this story. Simply, what have you done with this Jesus? And you see, don't you, in this story, a, a glimpse of what kind of a saviour he is, one who is filled with compassion even for unclean sinners like us. One who can make unclean people clean in God's sight by giving them his righteousness, making them a part of God's people and saving them from death. One who, though perfectly obedient himself, became like an unclean person and suffered the consequences for other people's sin when he died on the cross so that disobedient people like us can then be declared clean and welcomed in. And so have you come to him in faith like the leper did that day? Coming to him, imploring him, humbling yourself before him, believing in his power to save and putting all of your trust in him alone. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, as we've considered this story tonight, we thank you for all that it shows us of our Lord Jesus, that he is filled with compassion even for unclean sinners. Father, we know that because of our sin, our hearts and our lives are unclean. And yet Jesus welcomes us to himself and is filled with compassion for us. We thank you that in him we can be declared clean because his cleanness, his perfection, his purity, his righteousness is counted as ours, as if we ourselves had lived the perfect life that Jesus lived. We thank you that in him we can be made a part of your people and saved from death. And we thank you that Jesus suffered exclusion for the sake of unclean people like us when he died on the cross. And as it were, he swapped places with the unclean. He became like an unclean man as he underwent the cursed death of the cross. He was made to be sin for us. He suffered the curse for us. We praise you that the obedient one became like an unclean man, was cut off for sin, so that disobedient ones like us can be declared clean and gathered in. And so, Father, as we marvel at Christ and who he is and what he has done, we pray that you grant to all of us this evening the gift of faith in Jesus that we might come to him and we might cling to him and through faith alone, in him alone and by grace alone, receive all that he has done for us. And in his precious name, we pray all of these things. Amen. <coughs>
the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.